Hello everyone, I am Mike Lindsay. Thank you so much for viewing my channel. I am an emergency physician and I've done a fellowship in wilderness medicine. And today we are going to be talking about first aid kits. We're going to be talking about how to choose them, some items you need and maybe some you don't need. So let's go buy a first aid kit. All right, I am at my local pharmacy. Time to go pick out a first aid kit. All right, here's the first aid kits. Let's analyze a few of these first aid kits and see what they have in them. This first kit boasts an impressive 140 items and only 124 of which are band-aids. This next kit contains 70 items, but they chose to limit their band-aid contents to 59 of the 70 items. Okay, so unless you have some weird band-aid philia, you're not gonna wanna depend solely on supermarket first aid kits. What I recommend doing is finding a kit that's close to your perceived needs and then tweak it over time. Now, I'm not going to waste our precious time together by reading you a list of items in a first aid kit. There are plenty of people on YouTube doing that already. But I will include links to first aid item lists from reputable outdoor organization. But I'm going to be giving you some specific consideration and tips for your first aid kit. And once you combine that with one of those lists, it should really spark some ideas for you. So number one, the focus of this video is going to be on first aid kits outside the home. You can't carry everything with you, so size matters. If you're a medical professional or a multi-sport athlete, you probably need more than one first aid kit. If I'm going on an easy day hike, I'm probably gonna carry just the essentials, something like this or possibly even smaller. If I'm out camping, I'm gonna carry something a bit bigger, maybe something like this. Number two, since you have limited space, I'm more likely to choose a multi-purpose item. For example, if I'm looking for a medication for allergies, most likely I'm gonna use an antihistamine like Benadryl over another antihistamine like Zyrtec. The reason being Benadryl can be used as a sleep aid, it can be used for motion sickness, it can be used for other things, it's multi-purpose, whereas a medication like Zyrtec is gonna be more focused on just being an allergy medication. Finally, where you're going, who you're going with, how difficult will it be to evacuate, and your level of training all factor in to which specific items you should have in your kit. All right, now onto the meat of the talk. We just mentioned using multi-purpose items on our outdoor adventures, and it turns out a lot of things in our first aid kit can be used for survival as well. A lot of this stuff is flammable. A lot of people carry starter logs when they're out camping, and although these are great, they have one drawback. They serve absolutely no other purpose outside of starting fire. So instead of carrying these, why not try these instead? Cotton balls soaked in Vaseline. Vaseline lights really easily. You just need a spark. It has a number of medical uses. Just to name a few, it can be used to prevent blisters and it can also be placed on a wound to both promote wound healing and to soothe the wound. So why not consider a multi-use fire starter like Vaseline? Hand sanitizer is usually made of alcohol. And as any spring breaker with second degree burn can tell you, alcohol is flammable. Be very careful though, as the flame is very clear. Another thing you'll sometimes see in first aid kits are space blankets. I'm personally not the biggest fan of these unless you're one of those super ultralight backpackers. Yes, you, the person sawing their toothbrush in half to save weight. The reason I'm not the biggest fan is because they are more fragile than your ex's ego. The slightest poke from a stick and suddenly you've packed a very shiny piece of trash. Perhaps not the best choice for remote outdoor adventuring. Okay, that's a little bit of an exaggeration because a torn space blanket still makes a perfectly fine signaling item. However, its main purpose, which was providing warmth, is now not very effective. Unless I'm trying to be super ultra light, generally, I'm gonna pack a trash bag instead because it has more uses. They're waterproof, they can keep your stuff dry. They'll provide warmth and keep you dry at the same time, and they're much more durable. And I also have to mention, you will look fabulous and no one will make fun of you. If you would rather go with a space blanket instead, look for the ones with the plastic backing, like this. These are much more durable. Another multi-use item to consider is duct tape, but you don't have to bring this big guy. They sell it in miniature rolls. I'll provide some links down below. It can be used to repair equipment, prevent blisters, tape on bandages, and many other things as well. There's also safety pens. These can be sterilized and used to drain blisters, or they can be used to drain the hematoma under your toenail because you bought hiking shoes that didn't fit well. They can be used to make a shoulder sling out of someone's shirt. Before we talk about the next application of safety pins, which is a bit more gruesome and dire, we need to review a little anatomy and physiology to understand what's going on. Here's a cross section of a human head and we can see that there's a gap that we breathe through which is made by the back of the throat and the tongue. Whenever someone goes unconscious, the muscles that are holding the tongue in place relax. This can allow the tongue to fall backwards and it sometimes occludes the airway. This is a real problem for those of us who want to breathe or live. 
In the hospital setting, this can be remedied in several ways, such as by having a person hold what's called a jaw thrust or by placing a device called an oropharyngeal airway. However, in a remote setting, you may not have an extra person to hold the jaw thrust maneuver. Additionally, you're going to be limited by what equipment you have in your first aid kit. And most people are not going to be carrying an oropharyngeal airway into the wilderness. One option you do have... Oh my goodness, that's terrifying. What did I draw? It looks like Voldemort with no eyelids getting a colonoscopy. Hold on while I redraw that. Okay, that's marginally better, but we'll take it. One option you do have is to take a safety pen and go through the bottom lip and the tongue to pull the tongue forward and prevent it from occluding the airway. Once again, this is only in dire situations where you have no choice and for only those with specific training on the technique. What about medications? How should you carry them? Bottles are great, but they take up a lot of space. Individually wrapped is great, but you can't find every medication you want individually wrapped. You'll probably need a labeling and organizing system. This could be simple as Ziploc bags, or if you want to upgrade, you can get pill boxes where you individually label every compartment. Now let's go through some specific medications. Every medication I'm going to mention has contraindications, and it's up to you and your doctor to familiarize yourself with those contraindications. First, you're going to need a pain medication. This should be an NSAID like ibuprofen or naproxen, unless you have a contraindication. I also typically carry one full dose aspirin. Why? Because if you're out in a remote location and someone looks like they're having a heart attack, they're having crushing chest pressure, they can't breathe, they're nauseous, they're sweaty, you're going to want to do something while you're evacuating them and giving them a full dose aspirin is probably going to be the best thing for them. Another medication to consider is caffeine pills. Someone who's a daily soda or a coffee drinker goes out in the wilderness, suddenly they don't get their daily dose of caffeine, they're going to get a headache. We don't typically consider caffeine as a traditional pain medication, but in this situation, it would be. My personal preference is not to actually carry caffeine pills when I'm out, because usually if I'm out hiking, I'm gonna carry caffeinated energy blocks like these, I'm just going to give them one of them. Digestive medications are particularly important to international travelers and to campers. Depending on the size of my kit, I generally will carry two different anti-diarrheals just because it can be so crappy. The first is the anti-diarrheal loperamide, but I wanna focus on the second because I believe it is underappreciated. Pepto-Bismol. Pepto-Bismol is somewhat unique in that it's prophylactic against diarrhea. Taking two pills twice a day can reduce your chance of getting traveler's diarrhea in half. If you're interested in learning more about travel medicine, the CDC publishes a free online resource known as the Yellow Book. I'll leave a link in the description. What I carry for constipation is a bit unconventional. Mineral oil. Now this is not something I typically carry when I'm trying to be ultra light, but I do carry it when I'm camping, and here's why. Remember our discussion about keeping multi-purpose items in our kit? Well, in addition to treating constipation, mineral oil can do something that no other thing in my kit can do. Drown bugs. As an ER physician, I occasionally will have people that come into the emergency department with a live bug in their ear, and they look miserable every moment of that experience until that bug is dead. Putting water in the ear doesn't really seem to drown them, as it seems like they get a little air bubble formed around them, and then they just keep going and scratching on your eardrum. But mineral oil is actually thick enough that it'll drown them. Once the bug is dead, they'll no longer be scratching on your eardrum and the pain will be significantly reduced. You can get the bug removed once you get back to civilization. As an added bonus, and once again to the dismay of Smokey the Bear, mineral oil is combustible. In fact, it's what fire breathers sometimes use. Now that you realize you're listening to a pyromaniac ramble on about lighting things on fire, let's cover one thing that I know some of you are probably thinking. Cotton balls are flammable. Do I really need to add anything to an already flammable object? Well, yes and no. When you put them all together, you can clearly see that the mineral oil and the Vaseline have much larger flames than the cotton ball alone. In fact, I feel kind of embarrassed for the cotton ball's flame. Additionally, they burn for much longer. Mineral oil burned for about five minutes, Vaseline burned for about three minutes, and the cotton ball by itself, about 60 seconds. Time out. Even though I may make jokes about fires, do take them seriously, be responsible. They can damage our national parks, our forests, even our homes. Another drug to consider for GI complaints is Pepsid, otherwise known as Famotidine. Famotidine has a unique property and that is also an antihistamine. Histamine is the chemical responsible for allergic reactions. Most drugs that are marketed as antihistamines block the H1 receptor. However, Famotidine blocks a different histamine receptor, the H2 receptor. Because of this, we often combine both H1s, like Benadryl, with an H2, like Pepsid in the emergency department for severe allergic reaction. The other drug you should be carrying, if you're qualified to use it, are EpiPens, because these things save lives. Additionally, despite being marketed as a one-time use item, 
They typically do carry more than one dose in them, you just have to know how to get it out. Let me be clear, trying to get more than one dose out of this is very dangerous. If you have not been specifically trained on this, you should not attempt it. Giving the wrong dose of epinephrine can be fatal. Now let's talk about your skin. Having sunscreen in your kit is essential. Additionally, having hydrocortisone is a very nice addition. But what I want to focus on is DEET. DEET keeps away insects that could be spreading disease and I always carry it internationally. I am hyper aware that DEET is chemically a solvent and getting it on things like nylon or other plastics can ruin them. I've had it get on my watch face and completely ruin the watch face. Keep it away from your climbing equipment. Keep it away from your expensive rain shell. One diagnostic item you should consider in a group expedition is a pregnancy test. I'm going to give you a very simple formula. Young female with abdominal pain plus new positive pregnancy test equals evacuate. You cannot prove or disprove ectopic pregnancy in the field and this is a life-threatening emergency. Now let's run through some trauma items. For splinting, I recommend the SAM splints. These are padded, comfortable, they're malleable, so you can use them for different body locations from the wrist to the ankle and even a cervical collar with the right training. Okay, I'm going to get up on my soapbox for a minute because I see people use these wrong all the time. The point of splinting is to limit mobility, either over a joint or a fracture site. So if you do a wrist splint like this, it looks great, but there is no limitation in mobility. This is not accomplishing what a splint should do. To add rigidity to a SAM splint, you need to add a curb. Now, since I put a curb in this, it's much more rigid. In fact, it doesn't really move at all. Instead of a curb, you can also add a 90 degree angle. This will also make it very rigid. And despite my mockery of band-aids earlier, you will need a few band-aids in your kit. You do not need 20 of the same size, but having a few different sizes is very beneficial. Just restock them as you need. You're also going to need bandages and gauze. For this, I usually prefer the rolled up stuff like this, known by the brand name Curlex, though this is clearly not brand name. When you unroll it, it ends up being a long strand like this. This can then be used to say pad a splint. You can use it to hold a splint in place like this, or you can even use it to make a sling. When you use it as a bandage, you can wrap it around the extremity and it stays on quite well. Another good option to have are elastic bandages, otherwise known as ace wraps like this. Basically, these can be used to decrease swelling around an injured extremity. They also actually decrease pain. The mechanism is basically, when you have this around a joint, they cause a lot of stimulation. Because that stimulation competes with the pain receptors, overall you get less of a pain signal through, decreased pain. Another good option are hemostatic dressings. Basically, these are gauzes that are impregnated with chemicals that stimulate the clotting cascade. They also make powders, which I don't actually recommend because these powders at least have a theoretical risk of being drawn up into a vein and causing a blood clot somewhere else in your body. So I do recommend the ones that are impregnated, but not the powder. These are great for areas that are difficult to control the bleeding, maybe a place where you can't put a tourniquet or a large area of oozing or someone on a blood thinner. I actually use these in the emergency department sometimes. Now the vast majority of bleeding, you're going to be able to control with direct pressure, but for those you can't, you're going to need a tourniquet. These are life-saving. Additionally, these can be used in short-term situations where you simply cannot put direct pressure on. Take, for example, the patient that's in a very dangerous scene. Your priority is to remove them from that dangerous scene, and then you can assess the bleeding. Now, you'll see that there is a number of different types of tourniquets, and people love to debate which one is best. If you want a recommendation, I'll just tell you that the US Army uses the Generation 7 CAT, or Combat Application Tourniquet. I'll leave a link down in the description, but whichever tourniquet you choose to use, make sure that it's simple, that you can apply it with one hand, and that the width is at least one and a half inches or four centimeters. What about closing clean wounds outdoors? I can tell you that in my home, I do have suture material, but if I am backpacking, I'm probably not going to carry it because it is bulky. To do sutures, you need an anesthetic, you need a needle driver, you need a needle, you need scissors. Most of the time, I can accomplish the same thing using just this, Steri strips. For very small, clean wounds, you can even consider skin glue. Most of us would probably refer to this as super glue, though super glue is actually a brand name. The technical term for these glues are cyanoacrylate glues. So how do the expensive cyanoacrylate glues used in hospitals like maybe the brand name Dermabond compare to the hardware cyanoacrylate glues like super glue? There was actually a paper published in 2013 that looked at this very thing. With the paper, it is clear that the pharmaceutical grade cyanoacrylate glues are better than the hardware store cyanoacrylate glues. But to quote the authors, the hardware store glues, otherwise known as short chain cyanoacrylate glues, have been shown to cause localized inflammation, release toxic metabolites more quickly, and possess inferior physical properties for tissue adhesion. 
That being said, these drawbacks are relative, and although the commercial glues fall short of the standards set by their pharmaceutical counterparts, they still have a proven role. As reviewed above, a considerable amount of clinicians reported on the successful use of short-chain cyanocrylates for various acute care fixes without complication. The avid outdoorsman, whose pack is as light as his wallet, might prefer a tube of superglue for commonly encountered field equipment repairs and infrequent therapeutic use. Overseas, access to pharmaceuticals may be limited, influencing a practitioner's treatment preference. We believe that when applied judiciously in the same fashion as FDA-approved tissue glues, the hardware store cyanoacrylates instant adhesives can be used in a relatively safe and efficacious manner. What about tape? You're going to need some tape, but it's not very practical to carry six different types of rolls for various situations. You're better off choosing one or two, depending on what you're going to be using them for. If you're trying to be as light and multi-use as possible, maybe you just go with duct tape. In addition to one good tape, I also will keep a strip of kinesio tape in my kit because I prefer them for blisters. Coban is also a delightful adhesive. This is generally what a nurse uses after a blood draw to put the bandage around. It sticks to itself, great material. If you're looking for a pair of trauma shears, I highly recommend the Leatherman Raptors. These are very popular among ER staff and among EMS. They're sharp, sturdy, and can be used for plenty of different non-medical uses when you're, say, out camping. This is actually the second pair I've owned because the first pair was stolen from me while I was traveling. That's how much I like them that I bought them again. I'll place a link down in the description if you're interested. Blister stuff? I did an entire video on blisters, which I'll put a link to. Finally, let's talk about what you need to irrigate a wound. You want to pressure irrigate wounds in the six to 15 PSI or pounds per square inch range. Now it's hard for most people to see an irrigation and be like, oh yeah, that's definitely six to 15 PSI. It's a bit harder than that. I can tell you that you can achieve this range by irrigating with an 18 gauge angiocat, pushing it through a syringe. Let's look at some other options that you might have with you if you're out camping. One technique you'll often hear about is to take a Ziploc or other bag and then poke a hole in it with a needle. This is great in theory and somewhat clever, however it doesn't actually produce the pounds per square inch that you need to do effective wound irrigation. Irrigating with a bladder reservoir also does not produce the minimum pounds per square inch that you need. Examples of things that have been shown to reach the minimum pounds per square inch would be poking a hole in the top of a water bottle with either a needle or a syringe and then squeezing it. Some sport top bottles also can reach the minimum pounds per square inch you need to irrigate a wound. And finally, a syringe is pretty much the gold standard. Okay, so unless you have, I can't even keep a straight face. Oh, why did I do this to myself? Yeah, there's hair in that. Ow. You should film yourself taking I am! Oh, oh, this hurts. Oh man, this was a foolish decision. Okay, do it fast! Ow! Ow! Oh no, I put it over my eyebrow. Oh, why did I put it over my eyebrow? <laughs> yeah, there's hair on that one.